Mexico or somewhere like that, and they were standing in the background of a, of a pyramid, Mayan era. And they made the comment about if the Mayans, of course, there's a lot of stories about them predicting the end of the world this year, which they actually didn't, but, but if the Mayans were so good at predicting the future, why are there no Mayans around anymore? Good question. Back in July, I was at uh, Bellevue, and I had the opportunity to sit down with various cabins of campers who were in grade four, five, and six, and they were all allowed to ask me any questions they wanted to ask me about any subject, and three times I was asked, so well, how did the Mayans' predictions about 2012 fit into the Bible? Or something like that. And the simple answer is, well, they don't. It has nothing to do with biblical prophecy. It has nothing to do with the Bible at all. But it was a fair question because, for some reason, popular culture has really caught on to this. Even though the Mayans themselves did not actually predict the end, the calendar just ended in 2012. But, someone's caught on. And people have been asking that question. Many have tried to come up with dates for the end of the world. Some have even tried to use the Bible to come up with dates, despite the fact that Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour. Many have said, and I have even heard this, well, the Mayan predictions and, and, and things like that in the Bible, they're all interrelated, right? They'll go together, I mean, because all religions lead to the same place, right? We should say something this week about the fact that they don't. Revelation, the Bible, Daniel, Matthew, other parts of the scriptures talk about where the world is headed. And they all do so for one reason, and that is so that we may learn to trust in Jesus all the more, to know Jesus all the more, to be more like Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation was much like the book of Ezekiel that we looked at in through the months of June and July. It was a book written to a crushed and persecuted and hurting people so that they could have hope. And that they can find their hope in Jesus alone. It was written to help people understand that if you're with Jesus, ultimately, you're on the winning side. And if you're in a hopeless situation, that sure sounds good. We all need hope. And Jesus brings us great hope. Now, there's something we need to understand right off the bat. We as Christians don't ever see an end of the world. We talk about occasionally see the end will come and things like that. There is truly a climax of human history, but it leads to a new creation of the heavens and the earth. A perfect recreation. We believe in the redemption of God's creation, not an end to it. And that despite the failings we see in creation today, God still has a plan for his creation. It does not end. Our place is not ultimately in heaven, but in a reconstruction cleansed and recreated earth. One that is free of sin and free of struggle. C.S. Lewis, in his Narnia Chronicles, goes through seven books, and the final book is one about the end times. It is one that the mirrors the stories that we find in Revelation of, a, of an Antichrist rolling up and a tribulation occurring and bad things, and then finally God sweeping in the second coming, and calling his church to its ultimate destination. 
And they arrive at this ultimate destination. And if you don't read anything else of C.S. Lewis's Narnia books, the last two pages are worth reading. Because in the end, they come at the end of seven whole books to this conclusion. Everything that occurred in the seven books previously was the precursor to the real story. And when they got to their ultimate destination and they were in the presence of God's great kingdom, that was the true story. And that was the beginning. Ultimately for us, the end of the story is not the second coming of Jesus. That's the beginning of the story. We haven't even hit the true story of God's creation yet. We have so much to look forward to because the true story is yet to come. Revelation 19. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong our God. Power, glory, and salvation come from one source only. From one place. The people who were receiving the original book of Revelation had seen many of their members fall to martyrdom. They had seen a rejection by the Roman Empire of their worldview. They needed to find their hope in God. There are so many easier places to look for hope than Jesus. Easier ways. A deliverance that might take you out of trouble. To look to political or economic models. To look to all sorts of things that are easier than following Jesus. But a loud voice cries out, and we find earlier in the book that the church is already standing in the presence of God, and the loud voice that cries out is the church. And the church cries out. The church that is being brought out of their troubles below. And they call out and say, those who look to the politics of the Roman Empire. Those who look to economic law, they missed the boat. Salvation is from one source only, and that is Jesus. And here, as Satan and evil are finally defeated, there's a cry from the church about how God alone brings salvation. And in verse 2 we read, For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Condemnation. The reason why the church throughout history has found it difficult at times to remain faithful is because Satan truly is a seductress. Evil does seduce. But here there's vengeance. Vengeance from God. And the great hallelujah in verse 1 is because God is the strong God. We'd already seen, if you go back early in Revelation, that Satan is destroyed. It's almost replayed here. It's talked about again in chapter 19. The power of hatred is dying. Justice is brought to the world. And so in verse 3, they cry out again, What's more? They cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Great shout from heaven. At the excitement of the conquest, there, there's this shout that shakes heaven itself. A couple years ago, we had the Olympics go on in our own country. 
There's the excitement of the, the golden goal where Sidney Crosby scores to win the goal for Canada and shouts erupted from one end of the country to the other. I'm going to tell you that I had nothing on this shout. Nothing. When the church cries out that God has won. And we've witnessed it. We've remained faithful. We remain true and God has won victorious. There is a roar from the church. When all that was wrong is laid waste and smoke rises from it. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. This is the culminate. This is the idea of the chapter. This is actually the culmination of the entire book of Revelation, maybe even the entire New Testament. The marriage of the Lamb. Jesus doesn't just come as creator. He doesn't just come as conqueror. He comes as husband. In biblical language, we're going to discover this somewhat in the, in the I think sermon series. We're not going to get to it for a few weeks, but we're going to actually look at the biblical images of marriage. But in the Bible, the husband is always the one who is the sacrificer. It's a great image of Jesus, isn't it? And that's the indication here. There are three phases to a Jewish wedding. A Jewish wedding did not just occur the, you know, one Saturday you show up at church and somebody gets married. It was a much bigger affair than that. In fact, it took over a year to culminate a full Jewish wedding wedding. The first phase involved betrothal. It was a time in which the husband and the wife committed themselves to one another and yet stayed in separate households. It was a time of testing, of faithfulness. It was a time to decide whether this was truly the person that you were meant to marry. And it was one, maybe even two years in the making. A time of preparation. It began with a gift that was given to the bride. They were considered husband and wife. They were considered married, but the marriage itself was not consummated. It was testing for purity. It was a time of getting ready. And in the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus, to the church, to his people, that's the phase we are in today. That's where we're at now. The time of testing, the time of preparation, the time of getting ready, of, of preparing one's life and one's heart. That's where we're at now. That's the place of the church. Verse 8. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the state of the saints. The second phase of a Jewish wedding was the presentation, or the wedding ceremony itself. It was a time of final negotiations, and it could take some time. We have some images in the Gospels of Jesus talking about these, these virgins who were preparing for a wedding, and they not off to sleep, and some of them are ready and some of them aren't for when the actual wedding occurs. And, and sometimes we can look at that statement and that doesn't make sense because it doesn't match our weddings. But in their day, the day of the wedding came about, and it can take some time because what would happen is the groom would go and get all the, the family of the bride's family, all the bride's family together, not the bride herself, but the men of the bride's family. And during that year or two years of preparation, he would 
prepare a home for the bride. Sometimes, if it was a poor family, it might just be a room in the, the, in the groom's family home. If they were a little bit farther along in their life, maybe it was a whole home he would build. But whatever the case would be, on the day of the wedding, he would prove himself to the bride's family by taking them, and they would examine the home. And then there would be a time of presentation. First of the, the home that was built. And then the bride would come in and would be presented to the groom. To show that she was worthy of this new home that had been built. And that they were worthy of one another. The rapture in the New Testament is Jesus taking us into to eternity. And we're not presented with fancy clothes who were presented in the deeds of the righteousness of the saints, clothed in the very good deeds that the church has accomplished in the name of Jesus. Not the things that we've done ourselves, but the things that we've accomplished in Christ, in the glory of God. And the angel said to me, write this, this is verse 9, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This was phase 3. A feast by invitation only. A feast that can last a whole week or more. Do not miss it. Three parts to the wedding. The third is the supper and the time that follows. A time in which you were to step away from conflict. In fact, a new groom was not allowed to be in the army during this period. All concerns, all fights, all stresses were to be put aside to bring together the bride and the groom. The problem is we don't actually find the feast in this chapter. We find the call to the feast here. The feast itself is in the next chapter. A lot of people have questioned over the years. It starts talking about a, a thousand year period in which all the, the fights are put aside and then at the end of it we find a resumption, an end to the fighting. This thousand years talking about, well, that's the wedding feast. A feast that will last, where all the fighting and all the stresses are put aside for a period, and then at the end of it, they come back to it, and the final culmination, saying is put aside for a period of time. So the feast, so the wedding can be culminated, and then at the end, he's destroyed. Kind of like the reception today, but it lasted a lot longer. In the Jewish days it lasted a week. A week was a time, seven days, seven was a number of perfection. Well, here we have a thousand, it's even longer. A thousand years for the great culmination of salvation to be celebrated. But before we get there, we need a little bit of a different subject. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. It's an angel that the Apostle John is speaking to. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus, worship God. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Why did Jesus, or John, sorry, Suddenly reports a failing. Lesson is twofold. I think he wanted to show his readers how easily idolatry could sneak in. It can infiltrate one's life even through very innocent means. John turned this messenger into somebody worthy of devotion. There's so many times where we get distracted. We just came through, I mentioned 2010 Olympics a few minutes ago. Well, we just came through another Olympics. And through it all, it's so easy to get caught up in the pageantry. It's easy to get caught up in the, the concerts, the people watching, the security. 
everything else, and sometimes forget that it's really about athletics. Well, you know what? It's true for us. We get caught up in so many things and, and forget about Jesus and the core of it. That it's not about the things that we do, the things that we accomplish, the message even that we should preach. This is about a person who's divine and who came to bring us salvation, and our devotion is strictly to Jesus. And for just a split second, John forgot about that. And he's brought back, no, it's about Jesus. Verse 11, then I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse. Heaven's opened up to show what matters most. Interesting, isn't it? Now we don't have a picture of a lamb. We have a picture of a conquering king. Verse 11 finishes. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. We have some very unusual words here. We're told he's called faithful and true. The word faithful is not our typical word faithful in the Bible. The better word is Genuine. Genuine. The first part of the book of Revelation talks all about an antichrist coming up. One who purports to be a savior, but is a false one. One who looks good, who brings a political and economic solution to all of the world's problems. We have a lot of political and economic problems in our world. And one comes along with a solution that comes out of human ingenuity. Hey, Mommy! Who's smart enough to solve all of our problems. Who has moral fiber to solve all the world's problems. Somebody who looks really good, but it's not Jesus. Not Jesus. Here we have one who comes who's genuine. It's actually worthy of our worship. Same with the idea for the word truth. It says faithful and true. The word true does not have anything to do in the Greek with the word truth. The word true is an unusual word, but it means ideal or perfect. The Antichrist was the best we could get. That's what everybody thought. It's what everybody's meant to think. That there's one who's, who's close enough. Well, here we get a ruler who is ideal, who is perfect. These are great images for persecuted people who are standing opposed to the Roman Empire that, that makes things function pretty good. Well, hang on. There's a ruler coming who's better yet. Who's better than anything. Don't settle. Wait. Verse 12. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linens, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Great images. This iron rod, the idea is a shepherd's crook, because he's the great shepherd. But not one made out of wood. Not, something's going to last. It's made out of iron. He's king and shepherd. The word rule here, literally, in these verses, is shepherd. <clears throat> Usually don't think of a king as a gentle shepherd. It's a particular one who rides out on these great white horses as a, as a conquering army, but here he does. He's a conqueror, and yet he's gentle. But he has power. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God, of God the Almighty going to press down in power. 
bring justice. Keep in mind, these are oppressed people that are being written to, and they see him coming, and the true king will bring justice and will show that they are right, and that they were right to fully serve God. On his robe and on his thighs, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, a proclamation of his name. He is the one with universal sovereignty. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. An angel in the sun declares a very different kind of feast from the marriage feast. One of justice. It's a gruesome couple of verses here. A harsh contrast between those who are judged right and those who are judged harshly. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting <coughs> on the horse and against his army. The beast was captured. And with it the false prophets who in his presence had done the signs by which he would deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. The birds were gorged in the flesh. We've already had in the book of Revelation the Battle of Armageddon. This has already occurred. This is a retelling. Why is it so important? It's because eternity matters. We're not given a map in the book of Revelation as to exactly how it's all laid out. Here we have, we kind of go back and forth sometimes in the story. And here we have that. When we're being told that the God of love will come, and he will bring his hope to a crushed, hurting, oppressed people. To a persecuted people. That things will be made right and you will win. Those who hate you, who hate me, Jesus is saying, will learn what the truth is. Will be made right. To the point that the church needs to always refocus on the things that we have in Christ, who is preparing us for this time of testing, for this great moment of reunion with a great Savior. To learn to focus on Jesus alone. So many have even tried to take the church and teach it that we should be instruments for bringing about a political solutions for our world. heard a while back a pastor from the states who was talking and said democracy was the great hope for our world. And I shook my head and said, where on earth did that come from? I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I'm a great proponent of democracy. I'm really glad I live in one. But what is democracy? It's ruled by the people. People are sinful. People make mistakes. People blow it. Because some of our elections, I mean, it's the best we've got at the moment, but I'm sure hoping and waiting for something better that's a real hope. Others have tried to promote, well, socialism, or this system, or that. Sorry, but any human system is not the solution that we're looking for. We're holding on for something better. Don't be deceived. Hold on. Others have claimed that science is our great hope. Hold on for something better. It's all false. Because they all rely on human ingenious. It's not that I'm opposed to those things necessarily. But they're stopgap measures. Jesus is our hope. All other things will be destroyed 
Seek Jesus alone and seek Jesus always. Bow before Jesus because he is our majestic king.